Hello everyone, you are watching 666 The Mark of the Beast and Gematria, Part 2. Before I get into this video, I just want to mention that uh, in Part 1, then I said that Greek letters can be used as numbers. And if you uh, would like to see a chart of uh, the different Greek letters uh, being used as numbers, so that you can, um, you know, try and calculate different names to see if they match up with, uh, add up to 666. Um, there is a chart on my website. I put it there after I published uh, part one. And uh, there's a link in the description box under this video. If you go to the bottom, there's a section of the description that's titled something like more information or for more information. Um, one of the links there is a link to my website um, and it'll bring you directly to that page. So if you'd like to look at that, it's available for you to look at. Revelation chapter 15 uh, verse 2 says, I saw something like a sea of glass mixed with fire, and those who overcame the beast, his image, and the number of his name, standing on the sea of glass, having harps of God. What is the number of his name? Now that's the main point of this video. The number of his name. Gematria slash isosophy. Because letters can be used to represent numbers in Hebrew and Greek, every name and word could be thought of as a number. Finding out the number of a word or name, and usually comparing two or more words slash names together in this way, is called gematria. I believe it's also called isosophy for Greek, from the Greek adjective isos, which means equal. It seems that gematria plays a part in numerology, and even astrology. So if you look for, for information about it, you may come across some interesting and incorrect information about how the world works. I just wanted to give you a heads up. So if you were to look up Gematria on YouTube, um, you'd find different stuff. Um, there's a good reason to use Gematria still, even though it's connected to uh, numerology and astrology. Gematria is believed to have been invented by the Assyrians, Babylonians, or Egyptians. This is according to people on YouTube, some of whom might not be as dependable as others. Now notice these are my references. If you go to the description, um, there is a references section. This is reference 1, reference 2, reference 3. Um, and if uh, the reference is uh, from a website or a video on YouTube, then they will, there will be a link to it. If it's a book, it'll just have um, the information so that you can look that book up in a library or something like that. The ancient Hebrews used gematria. So the Jews might have gotten the idea from the Babylonians when they were in captivity in Babylon for about 70 years. The Greeks, specifically Pythagoras, might have gotten the idea from the Babylonians as well or perhaps the Egyptians, who very likely influenced Pythagoras in his mathematical philosophy. Here are some important points about gematria that will help us to understand the number of the beast. Gematria is traditionally done in Hebrew. Gematria can be done in many, many ways. There is basic gematria, milieu gematria, and shape gematria, and more, each of which will render a different result. The reason why I say traditionally done in Hebrew is because if you were to look up gematria on YouTube, you'd see gematria with English, gematria with Hebrew. You might see a little bit of gematria with Greek. Um, so when you, if you were to try to calculate someone's name to com to see if it adds up to 666, it's good to know that traditionally gematria was done in Hebrew. I would say for uh, 
to see if someone's name adds up to 666 because uh, Revelation was written in Greek and because Greek was a uh, the language of trade during uh, the time that Revelation was written, then I would say that Greek would also be a legitimate uh, language to use to calculate the number. And then maybe if you know that the Antichrist is, say, Spanish, then you could add up his name in sp using Spanish characters or letters and um, calculate it that way. But I would mostly stick to Greek and Hebrew. The reason why I say this, how there's uh, many ways you can do it, is because, again, if you look it up, you'll see people saying you could do it this way, that way, the other way. I would stick to basic gematria because Revelation chapter 13 doesn't, it just says calculate it. It doesn't say give any more information. So I would say, in general, um, it's probably just, he was probably just um, relaying information about basic gematria because there's no more information other than just calculate it. So I'd stick to basic. Conclusions. Some people believe the name of the beast is Nero Caesar. This is because Neron Kesar in Greek can be transliterated into Hebrew as this, these, uh, this name, which is 50 plus 200 plus 6 plus 50 plus 100 plus 60 plus 200. So uh, Greek, uh, Hebrew is read from right to left. And this is 50, this is 200, this is 6, this is 50, this is 100, this is 60, this is 200. So that's why it's important to know right to left. Because if you were to do this, you'd be going backwards and you'd be, you'd be confused. Um, others believe that other names might be the name of the beast. Euanthus equals 666 in Greek, and so do some other names. Some thinking Domitian, another emperor of Rome, was the Antichrist. Um, the only thing that's important to know about this name here is... Uh, Nero Caesar, first of all, is a Roman name, therefore it's a Latin name. Um, in order to come to this, the people who came to this name uh, first took the Greek version of the name, Neron Caesar, Greek, not Latin, different languages, first took the Greek version of the name Nero Caesar and then transliterated it from Greek into Hebrew. So um, this isn't the normal way that they would spell Nero Caesar. It's kind of like changing the name a little bit. Um, it does add up to 666, but it's not the normal way, uh, the normal name they would call Nero Caesar. Though, according to Wilk slash Thayer, um, it is um, supposedly sometimes they would use this spelling. Um, so some people believe it's legitimate. Revelation says. While it might be easy to simply say that Nero or Domitian was the beast in Revelation because they persecuted Christians in John's day, let's not jump to conclusions. Nero died in 68 AD, and by 90 AD, Domitian was in power. While those who hold that Nero was the beast believe Revelation was written in 68 AD, it's generally believed to, to have been written in 96 AD, or a few years before that. So 68 AD, 96 AD. Now, um, obviously, if you were to believe that John wrote um, Revelation, uh, when he wrote Revelation, he intended for, he, he knew that Nero was the beast. And if you believe that he, instead of saying Nero's name, he wanted it cryptically, to say it cryptically, that way only certain people would be able to understand what he's saying. And um, if you believe that he wrote it when Nero was alive, you would have to believe that it was written 68 AD or earlier because Nero died in 68 AD. Um, but like I said, it's generally believed to have been written in 96 AD, which would have been in Domitian's rule. So the commonly accepted date of Revelation's writing agrees more with Domitian being the beast than Nero. This is assuming John was even talking about a Roman emperor in his day. This is assuming John knew who the beast was, like I said, and he was um, trying to express it in a cryptic way so that um, the wrong people wouldn't understand it and the right people would figure it out. In Revelation chapter 13, verse 3, it says, One of his heads looked like it had been wounded fatally. His fatal wound was healed, and the whole earth marveled at the beast. Verses 11 through 15 say that the second beast, quote, exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence. 
that he performs great signs, even making fire come down out of the sky to the earth in the sight of people. And it was given to him to give breath to it, to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as wouldn't worship the image of the beast to be killed. The word translated as breath from Greek can mean spirit or breath. So up here where it says, it was given to him to give breath to it, to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as wouldn't worship the image of the beast to be killed. Um, breath can be spirit or breath. So in the New Testament, when it says Holy Spirit, the Greek word that's translated as spirit um, is this same word, same word. Um, and in the Old Testament and the New Testament, there's an idea that anything with breath or with a spirit is alive. So in a psalm, David said, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. That's uh, King James Version translation. Um, and, and I believe that the Greeks would have agreed with that idea that everything with breath or a spirit was alive. So the second beast was given the, ab the ability to give the image of the beast life almost, either uh, literally to have life or just making it look like it was alive. And it, so that it could uh, speak and it could in a, some way kill those who would not worship it. Verses 16 through 18 say that no one would be able to buy or to sell unless he has that mark, the name of the beast or the number of his name. Now, the reason why I'm showing you all of this uh, from 13 and then down here, I'm talking about chapter 19, is because um, all of this is prophecy about what the first and second beast will do or what will happen to them. And a lot of times people take things out of context, say they take this one verse uh, Revelation chapter 13, verse 3, one of his heads looked like it had been wounded fatally, his fatal wound was healed, and the whole earth marveled at the beast. So then when they see someone uh, who was wounded in their head, everyone thought he was going to die, he has a quote-unquote miraculous recovery, um, you know, no brain damage, he's on TV, he's become famous, everyone's like, whoa, this is so cool, Oprah has him on her show, all of a sudden, could he be the beast? Maybe, maybe not. But the thing is, is that's just one verse. You have to take prophecy the way it's supposed to be taken. You can't take it out of context. You can't take one thing and another and another and, and ignore the rest. Everything that prophecy says must be fulfilled in the way that it's meant. So you have to first figure out what does prophecy mean, and then you can determine was prophecy fulfilled or are we still waiting for it to be fulfilled. So that's why I bring up all of this stuff. All of this must happen to the beast or or, uh, or the beast and the second beast will do it. So one of his heads looked like it had been wounded fatally. That means something. Probably he will be wounded. Um, and his fatal wound was healed. And then it talks about the second beast who exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence, the presence of the first beast. Um, performs great signs, even making fire come down out of the sky to the earth and the sight of the people. So the second beast will be probably something like the second-hand man of the first beast. And he will do all of these things, even making an image of the first beast to seem alive or to literally be alive, so that the image can talk. Image could be a statue or something else, I don't know. Um, and could kill people or maybe just command people to be killed. So there's a lot of stuff uh, that prophecy talks about the first beast and the second beast that obviously has not been fulfilled in any two people. And notice that they're both around at the same time. It's not the first beast comes, he dies. The second beast comes, then he dies. They're both around at the same time. They're both active at the same time. The second beast um, works for the first beast and is kind of like a priest, I guess you could say, because... Um, he makes it so that um, everyone who doesn't worship the image of the beast is killed. Or at least he gives life to the image of the beast, and then the image of the beast kills people who don't worship it. Um, so some people might equate the second beast to like a, uh, well, it calls him a false prophet, but people might say he's like a priest or something like that. The word translated as breath, oop, wait, no, I read that. Um, and then verses 16 through 18 say no one would be able to buy or to sell unless he has that mark, the name of the beast, or the number of his name. So also 
um, the second beast will give a mark to everyone, and if they don't receive the mark, if they refuse to receive the mark, they will not be able to buy or to sell unless they have the mark. That hasn't happened yet either. So that's my point, is that you have to take it the way it's meant to be taken. I believe it's all the same thing. It's all the same chapter. There doesn't seem to be any breaks um, in the wording or any time difference. The first beast, the second beast, they each are two individuals, in my opinion. Um, and you have to try and figure out what prophecy is saying, and then, un and then you can understand if it's already happened or it hasn't. Here's an overview of Revelation chapter 19, verses 11 to 21. I saw the heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on it is called Faithful and True. In righteousness he judges and makes war. The armies which are in heaven followed him on white horses, clothed in white, pure, fine linen. That's verse 14, uh, verse 11, is this quote. He has on his garment and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. This is verse 16. I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army. The beast was taken, and with him the false prophet who worked the signs in his sight, with which he deceived those who had received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. These two were thrown alive into the lake of fire that burns with sulfur. That quotation is from verses 19 and 20. Now, um, like I said, uh, everything that it talks about the beast has to be fulfilled, and this is also talking about the beast, the same beast that it mentions in chapter 13. So you don't have to just look at chapter 13, you also have to look at other parts in Revelation that mention that same beast. As long as it's talking about the same thing, you have to look at it also. Um, and it's pretty obvious that this has never happened where someone with king of kings and lord of lords never come out of heaven with an army um, to fight against the beasts and the kings of the earth and um, these two were thrown alive into the lake of fire that burns with sulfur that hasn't happened yet the beast and the false prophet or the second beast um, have not been thrown alive into the lake of fire now um, the reason why we know that the false prophet is the second beast is because it says uh, with him the false prophet who worked the signs in his sight, with which he deceived those who had received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. So that's pointing back up to uh, chapter 13 where it says that the second beast exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence, that he performs great signs, even making fire come down out of the sky to the earth in the sight of the people. So it's pretty clear that the second beast is called the false prophet in chapter 19. Now, some people believe that chapter 19 is symbolic for uh, Jesus symbolically leading the church in victory over the world. I don't agree with that at all. I think that chapter 19 is very literal. And the reason why I say that is because, first of all, it's obvious that um, the King of Kings and Lord of Lords is Jesus Christ. No one else. Just him. Uh, he comes out of heaven. He's on a white horse. His name is called Faithful and True. He judges and makes war in righteousness. Uh, the armies of heaven follow him, and his he has a name written on his thigh and on his garment, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Who else could it be other than Jesus the Christ? So maybe they say, okay, well, Jesus leads the church. All right, well, the problem with that is, is the armies which are in heaven followed him on white horses clothed in white, pure, fine linen. They would say that's the church. But the thing is, is throughout the Bible, um, the church is, I don't, I can't think of any time where the church or Christians are called the armies which are in heaven. In fact, what is called the armies which are in heaven or the, uh, the heavenly armies or the heavenly hosts, the hosts of heaven or the hosts of the Lord is angels. If you go into the Old Testament, you will see references of God. God. One of the names that people use for God is God of armies or God of hosts. And um, you will see uh, at least one time, actually more than that, where it mentions how the, the uh, army of the Lord fights for the Israelites. That would be angels, not the Israelites, the angels. Also, I'm going to uh, open this up, show you here. In Luke chapter 2, verses 8 through 14, it mentions how there's 
uh, shepherds in the field and an angel of the Lord comes to them. He tells them that the Messiah is here. He says, don't be afraid for behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which will be to all the people for there is born to you this day in the city, city of David, a savior who is Christ the Lord. And then after saying what he said, then suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly army praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. Now my main point is here, it says suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly army praising God. In the King James Version it says there was a multitude of the heavenly host praising God. Host means an army. In Greek it's... Uh, uh, multitude is plethos, and then army is stratias, and then heavenly is uraniu. So it's plethos, stratias, uraniu, which is multitude, uh, a multitude, a multitude of the heavenly army praising God, basically. So um, it's pretty clear that the army that comes from heaven, here in the Old Testament, uh, the host of the Lord or God of hosts. When it talks about that, and in Revelation, the armies which are in heaven followed him on white horses, it's talking about angels. It's not talking about Christians, saints, or the church. Now, personally, I believe that saints are Christians, and Christians are saints, and that there's, they're one and the same, there's no difference. Um, but I still wanted to make that clear, that it's not talking about Christians, saints, or the church. All right, so... Um, at least part of Revelation is supposed to be taken in chronological order. This is suggested by the sequential seals, which you can find the seals in Revelation chapters 6 through 8, the sequential trumpets, which are found in Revelations, Revelation chapters 8, 9, and 11, um, and then the sequential bowls, which is found in chapters 15 and 16. The only way I can see the events mentioned in Revelation as being fulfilled by something that has already happened is if the text is stretched beyond its limit to explain things. Even if everything is taken as purely symbolic, not everything in Revelation can be adequately explained. I do admit that sometimes prophecies can possibly be fulfilled in part by one person at one time and later fulfilled in part by another. The prophecies concerning the Messiah are a pretty good example of prophecies being half fulfilled. Jesus fulfilled some of the prophecies concerning the Messiah when he came the first time, and when he comes back at the start of his millennial kingdom, he will begin to fulfill the rest. However, because of the sequence of revelation, I tend to believe that it will happen over a single period of time, and that it will happen in the order given in revelation. Because of that, I believe we do not know who or what the beast is, but his name, maybe not his name from birth, but the name he goes by when he is in power, will add up to 666. I believe that it will be obvious to almost everyone that the mark is the mark of the beast. Revelation chapter 13 verse 16 and 17 says, He, the false prophet or the second beast, causes all, the small and the great, the rich and the poor, and the free and the slave, to be given marks on their right hands or on their foreheads, and that no one would be able to buy or to sell unless he has that mark, the name of the beast or the number of his name. Now, uh, the italics in this quotation is all my emphasis. I'm just trying to point out certain things. Uh, some people who receive the mark of the beast will have a name and some a number. Now, notice that it says... Um, that no one would be able to buy or to sell unless he has that mark, the name of the beast or the number of his name. Some people might think that that there might be three different versions of the mark of the beast. One is a mark or a symbol. One is the name of the beast, might be in English, might be in Hebrew, might be in Greek, or might be in uh, Babylonian or something else. Um, and then the third is the number of his name, which would be... Um, using gematria basically, so 666. I do not agree with that. I believe that um, the WEB, which is, this is the translation, WB, WEB is correct, that um, this is what it means, unless he has that mark, the mark being the name of the beast or the number of his name. So in other words, the mark of the beast is two things, not three. It's not a symbol, a name, and a number. The mark of the beast is a name or a number.
I've looked at the Greek. That makes more sense from the way it, it says it. Um, the mark will be visible either on the right hand, possibly on the forearm, as some have suggested the Greek word for hand can mean, or on their forehead. Now, the reason why I say visible here is because it says given marks on their right hands or on their foreheads. Marks are things that are visible. Some people say that um, that the mark is worshiping on Sunday, but the word mark is something that is visible, just like the letter I. It's something visible. Um, and it will be visible on the right hand, which some have suggested uh, the Greek word for hand can sometimes mean arm, or on their forehead. See, it says on their right hand or on their foreheads. It's a mark on their right hand or on their forehead. So if it was a microchip or something like a microchip, then it would probably also be a combination of a microchip and something like a tattoo, uh, probably something permanent, not, not like just an armband that they could take off later on. It would probably be some kind of a mark that's permanent like a tattoo. Um, and then also it could be a microchip or something else. Receiving the mark will be a requirement, though possibly not at first, to buy or to sell anything. So it says no one would be able to buy or to sell unless he has that mark. So my point in bringing this up is it will be obvious to almost everyone that the mark is the mark of the beast. And the reason is, is because it's very specific here. It says he, the false prophet, or the second beast, causes all the small and the great, the rich and the poor, and the free and the slave to be given marks on the right hands or on their foreheads, and dot, dot, dot. So a person does this, first of all, who will also do the other things that it talks about him doing. Um, they, they will be marks on their right hands or on their foreheads, specifically right hands, foreheads, um, and no one will be able to buy or to sell unless he has that mark. And it also even includes what the mark is, the name of the beast or the number of his name. It's very, very clear what the mark of the beast is in Revelation chapter 13, verses 16 and 17. Not only do we have very specific information about the mark, we also have very specific information about the beast and the false prophet in Revelation chapter 13. For example, the second beast performs great signs, even making fire come down out of the sky to the earth in the sight of people. That's a pretty obvious thing. You know, if you were to see someone um, making fire come down out of the sky to the earth in the sight of a large crowd, that's a big deal. And it says he performs great signs even. So in other words, he will do more than that. But this is just an example, an extreme example, a great show of his power that is given to him. So when the beast has full control, the things spoken about him and the false prophet, the second beast, begin to happen. And when the false prophet begins to force people to take a mark on their right hand or forehead in order to buy or to sell, there won't be any reason to wonder, is this the mark of the beast? However, I would still stay away from anyone claiming to be Jesus Christ and telling people to get 666 tattoos. Matthew chapter 24 verses 23 through 28 is my reference. Um, and even though this is Jesus talking in these verses, he's talking about, specifically talking about the time following the abomination of desolation. Uh, I believe that it's still relevant. These verses are still relevant right now, even though I believe that has not happened yet, um, according to scripture. Now, there was an event uh, in the past that was similar to the abomination of desolation, but I think that was like a shadow of what was to come. I don't think that that fulfilled it because uh, math, uh, Jesus mentioned the abomination of desolation in the future and uh, Jesus was around after that happened. So the abomination of desolation, there was like a, a shadow of that event and then, math, and then uh, Jesus uh, prophesied again about the same event as if it would happen in the future. So I think it was just a shadow of what will happen.
So basically what my point is about this is if someone is claiming to be Jesus Christ or people are talking about getting 666 tattoos and other stuff like that, I wouldn't um, hang around them because that can be dangerous. Even though the Mark of the Beast isn't out yet, um, I wouldn't mess with it. It's a dangerous thing and I, I wouldn't mess with it. Even if that's not the Mark of the Beast, um, it could still be like um, the Mark of the Beast, the equivalent of the Mark of the Beast, and it still could um, seal your fate like the Mark of the Beast because of the purpose of it, even though it's not really the Mark of the Beast mentioned in Chapter 13. Final thought. Don't take the Mark of the Beast. Turn to Christ instead. Revelation chapter 13 verse 8 says, All who dwell on the earth will worship him. Everyone whose name has not been written from the foundation of the world in the book of life of the Lamb who has been killed. So, everyone who dwells on the earth will worship him, who have not, who have, whose names have not been written from the foundation of the world in the book of life of the Lamb who has been killed. Jesus is the Lamb who has been killed. He has a book. If your name has not been written in his book from the foundation of the world, then when this happens, if you are alive, you will worship the beast. And you will take the mark. Which is why I say turn to Christ instead. It This is a warning. Turn to Christ. Now, I don't know if this will happen in half a year, if this will happen in two years, if this will happen in 30 years or 40 years or 50 years. I don't know. But I do know that if it does happen and we're still around or you're still around, I might be dead, who knows. If you're still around and you have not turned to Christ, then you will worship the beast. Revelation chapter 14 verses 9 through 12 says, Another angel, a third, followed them, saying with a great voice, If anyone worships the beast in his image and receives a mark on his forehead or on his hand, he also will drink of the wine of the wrath of God which is prepared unmixed in the cup of his anger. He will be tormented with fire and sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. The smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever. They have no rest day and night, those who worship the beast in his image, and whoever receives the mark of his name. Here is the patience of the saints, those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. So those who receive the mark and worship the beast are basically pledging their allegiance to the beast. They are sealing themselves as enemies of God. And either through um, famine, because it says that you will not be able to buy or to sell unless you have the mark, either through starvation, then you will take the mark, or through uh, perhaps torture, you could decide to take the mark. And it says that if you are not written in Jesus Christ's book of life from the foundation of the world, then you will worship the beast. So I say, turn to Christ instead. Um, now, there's a few reasons, I believe, why it's possible why uh, everyone will take the mark. Um, like I just mentioned, famine or starvation and then torture. And the reason why I think that, I, this is my theory, I don't know, uh, is that Christians would be able to withstand that is because either God for example, might uh, just literally protect them from those things. Or another thing is, is God might empower them because it says in the Bible, when you become a Christian, when you become a Christ follower, um, then the Holy Spirit will come and live inside of you. And the Holy Spirit can empower you. It can empower you to be super strong. Samson became really strong when the Spirit of the Lord rested on him, and he was able to, as it says in the King James Version, smite his enemies. Um, but there's a lot of other times where the Spirit of the Lord rested on people. Um, this was before he dwelt in them. But where the Spirit of the Lord empowered them, and they were able to withstand things. So, for example, Stephen, or Stephen, when he was stoned, it said that the Spirit of the Lord... Uh, I don't remember what it says, strengthened him or rested on him or something like that. And even though he was being killed, he asked God, Father, please forgive them for they do not know what they do. That was God's spirit that strengthened him to be able to have compassion on the very people that were killing him as they were killing him. 
So, again, don't take the mark of the beast. Turn to Christ instead. All right, thank you everyone for watching this video.